Lokaroot is an international uh, non-profit working in the field of uh, early grade literacy and girls education and we are currently working across 17 countries across the world and in India we are in 11 states. So uh, and we have been uh, ever since we started in, two th- in the year 2000. It's an organization which has been focused in these two areas of working which is early literacy and girls education to that extent that we have not done anything else but focusedly worked on these two areas only. So a uh, few of the things that really differentiates Room to Read from other NGOs. Uh, uh, one, the fact that this is an international organization, so it, it kind of does a huge amount of cross-learning that happens across the various countries. And, and we, therefore, our programs get benefited from this cross-learning that happens in, from every country. We are constantly learning. We are a learning organization who build on our, our learning across across the organization. The second thing is all our programs are very much based on international research and best practices. Whether it's the literacy program or the girls education program, we are constantly reviewing what the international research is saying about these areas. Like for example, in literacy, we our literacy program is very much focused on the latest research around neurocognitive science, brain science, and how that helps in literacy acquisition. So a lot of research uh, uh, goes on, on on both the programmatic domains. The third thing that helps us uh, uh, differentiate is the fact that we are uh, an implementing organization. So our core is still implementation. Uh, so we directly implement our programs in the field and, and all our learnings are generated from actually working in the field. So whatever you say, whatever you do is very much based on ground level learning that's happening in the field. So that learning is then distilled, compiled and then presented in a form that can be applicable to the sector in general. So we are both a implementing organization as well as an organization who works on, you know, larger thought leadership issues in the sector. So we do do both, both both of them. Um, because in many cases, you'll find certain uh, non-profits who probably excel in the technical assistance side, but not to be level organizer working. Okay. And in certain cases, you find non-profits who are very field level, but they are not there at the, at the strategic uh, thought leadership level. So, Room to Read as, as an organization kind of straddles both the, both these sectors, and we are both a field level organization as well as a national level technical assistance organization. Um, yeah, those, these are the main uh, points I think which uh, differentiates us from other similar nonprofits. Gender equality in girls' education is one of our pillars. As I just said, we work in two pillars. One is right. the uh, early literacy, and the other is the girls' education and gender equality. Now, our key. Uh, why it's important, I think that it doesn't really uh, require anybody to emphasize the fact that girls' education is so important because as you educate girls, the uh, uh, course of a country's uh, growth, growth trajectory, an educated woman can support their family better, they can have less kids, they will have more health, health, health and nutrition status will be more and an educated woman is more likely to uh, educate her children uh, much better. So, so I think uh, the importance of uh, girls' education and, uh, is definitely well established. But Room to Read does as a as a process to um, you know to help girls get educated. Is we have a focus on a life skill based approach. So. What our input, primary input is that we work with girls in government uh, primary schools, primary and secondary schools. And in these schools, what we do is we work with a cohort of girls from grade six to grade 12 and provide them a structured life skills input across this journey of six, seven years. Now, why life skills? Because we believe that life skills is a key differentiator uh, for a girl to be able to uh, resist the pressures that comes to her 
education. So say pressure against getting married, uh, you know, either. So if you look at the girls' education sector in the country today, you often find girls dropping out of schools due to various factors, including early marriage and, you know, trafficking, um, just uh, being pulled, pulled out of school for sibling care. So uh, life skills is one critical component which helps a girl to overcome uh, or resist all, all this pressure to develop an agency of girls. This, that's very critical for gender equality. And, 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 and also to uh, almost negotiate their key life decisions. And that those are very critical aspects of life skills to be able to exercise their right, develop an agency, negotiate their life decisions. And these are all very key components of a gender equal society. So, uh, so whatever we do, our our inputs through the life skills curriculum, ultimately the effort is girls, uh, you know, exercise their right and create a more uh, gender equal society in the long run. Room to Read, as, uh, as I said, is an organization who is very much based on research and evidence. So uh, from our initial days itself, we uh, measuring impact has been a key component of our program. So all programs, whether literacy or education, we have uh, very strong indicators of learning improvements, both in the literacy side, as well as life skills improvement in the girls education side which we uh, measured and which we have evolved over time. You know, uh, I mean, in the first um, 10, 15 years of Room to Reach journey, we have kind of um, tried these indicators, field tested them, improved upon them. And so those are like very strong measures that we have to um, measure impact in both literacy and girls' education. Having said that, I mean, uh, so that part was established. We did have impact at a very, uh, at the child level, that impact has always been unquestionable. Now, the problem happened when you were talking about large systems, because what you were doing were you were, you were working with a group of children whether, or a group of girls, and, and you were measuring impact there. But the challenge in India is not, it's so huge. It's about larger systems. You know, if, if 50% of your kids across the country are not able to read and write at the levels they should be doing, uh, just working with 100 kids or 200 kids and even doing a very high impact with these kids does not move the needle because ultimately you, you are, you know, most, most of your kids are still uh, not learning. So I think the challenge for us is how do you how do you scale up this impact and how do you scale up this impact in a sustainable way? Uh, now, that's always very challenging and that's uh, challenging for any nonprofit that's been working in India. Because, you know, one is that as a nonprofit, you have a, you have a certain bandwidth. So if you, if you rapidly scale up your interventions, uh, that there's a high chance that your, the quality of your inputs get diluted and therefore the impact gets affected. At the same time, what happens is um, you always uh, are, are struggling with a system which is uh, far optimal. So the system itself has several challenges. Um, there are accountability issues, there are funding issues. So the things that you are doing in the, in the small uh, set of, with the small set of kids that you're working with, it's not always scalable because the system or the government doesn't have the funds to scale it up or have, does not have the intention to scale it up or even the bandwidth to scale it up. So there are those kind of uh, challenges that um, that happen. And and we, as you know, in, in India, an additional challenge is governments themselves are not very, you know, not always, I would say, or base their decisions on evidence. So even if there's evidence of success, that doesn't guarantee that the government is going to kind of scale up that intervention. So there are several challenges on that front. Uh, so what we did was, uh, so we uh, we followed what we now call I do, we do, you do approach. It's a very scaffolded approach to scale up where, where what you say is the 
in the first instance i do is when you demonstrate uh, a program and demonstrate the evidence of success so you basically intensively work in a group of schools you 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 show or you create evidence of that model succeeding then in the you we do stage which was the critical innovation that we got in uh, we basically work with the government uh, collaboratively with the government we work so that uh, you build up the systems uh, within the within the government and it's almost a joint implementation with the government and therefore you strengthen the systems of the government to deliver the things and then finally you move to a you uh, to stage where you expect the government to scale up things so typically um, what happens is uh, you know one would do and i do a demonstration and then expect the government to scale up which is almost a you do uh, what we brought in is this uh, is this middle stage of we do where we said that let's work with you we told the government that let's work together uh, implement a program jointly so that you know what is what it takes to kind of do an effective implementation and i think that the uh, the key component of we do or a partnership whatever you call it with the uh, government uh, was a key uh, uh, process which we introduced in our scale up journey till now this has worked well uh covid of course has been a big uh, learning for all of us you know yes. most of our work was pre covid most of our work was with the children with the schools directly within the schools so obviously when school, when covid struck and schools were closed uh, we were majorly affected because all our work came to a standstill because schools were closed we could not go out to the children we could not go out to the teachers so that was definitely a very big challenge uh, thankfully we uh, we were able to pivot very quickly so what we uh, what we thought was that ultimately what is it that children are not going to school but there has to be a way to reach out to the children so that as as they continue to remain at home how do you maintain their education continuity because we didn't want a situation where kids are out of school for long and then they forget everything that was taught so all our effort were basically to reach out to the kids and uh, technology came in very handy uh, or so we thought at least that the technology would be the only way to reach out to kids who are at home um, governments were also doing the same thing so we developed quite a, a variety of content both for kids as well as for teachers uh, on the uh, on the digital online space so we developed things like read aloud videos we developed things audio clippings video clippings aimed at the students aimed at the parents and the teachers we developed uh, online teacher training programs so all of those kind of things were uh, were, were developed very in very quick succession we also uh, in as we started rolling them out we started also getting feedback that uh, access to digital technology was a challenge so all children were not getting access to the kind of online materials that we were providing or we were disseminating so so we quickly again pivoted and we started doing a lot of uh, content dissemination through mass media so just uh, radio television telephone basic telephony so we had programs on literacy in larascus over radio or community radio or uh, you know television so that was another set of uh, initiatives that we took uh, and then towards the end of uh, 2020 i would say we were very clear, clearly seeing that even those mass media were not reaching to all children so uh, then our uh, our programming again pivoted to developing more content which is self instructional self learning kind of materials and but physical materials so that you get something to physically to a kid uh, and the materials were developed in a language in a in a manner that they were um, they were almost self instructional you don't need a lot of adult supervision uh, for the children to work on those 
So there was a whole plethora of those kind of materials that were developed uh, towards the entire 2021, I would say. And then we also uh, worked a lot on developing home as the learning space because schools are closed, uh, learning happens at home or whatever happens. So how do you really empower the parents, help them to sit with the kids or facilitate some kind of learning happening at the, uh, at the home? Now, obviously, we all know that all parents are not educated. I mean, there are, uh, and, and they do not even have the time to engage with children in a sustained manner. So, so we tried developing short, um, you know, guidance for parents. Uh, we developed a parent calendar. We developed audio uh, messages to parents, telling them what they can do with the children at home. So, uh, so that became a, a major input after that. Now, as schools are opening, uh, two, three things again coming to four. Very, we all now it's all known now that there's a huge learning loss that the kids are coming with. So, we are focusing on um, one. We are focusing on strategies on how to meet this learning loss, which could be curricular restructuring, which could be bridge programs, which could be additional content that uh, children should be exposed to. We are trying to train teachers on how to uh, address the learning loss. That's the other thing that we are doing. And finally, what we are doing is we are also, uh, you know, working to strengthen that home as learning space concept that I talked about that even after school, children come back to school, to expect that the school would be enough to uh, meet all the learning loss would probably not be enough because, I mean, there has to be some learning that happens at home to supplement what's happening. So, yeah, I mean, these have been the various uh, phases of our COVID response, if I would say so. And we have used technology on, on various forms. So, with this, obviously, use of technology for creating, uh, you know, learning content. So learning content for children, learning content for teachers. Learning content for children includes, as I said, read aloud videos, flip books, audio activities. Uh, we have uh, we have now created something called a literacy cloud, which is which is essentially a cloud-based platform, which has storybooks um, from all of our room countries. So it's a huge compilation of very exciting storybooks for for the children and and that's available along with other resources for reading for anybody to go and you know go and browse all the storybooks so that's a very big very exciting product that we created during this time i mean it was in planning but then the covid kind of hastened up the process and we we, we kind of rolled it out and i think that's a very exciting product we also have uh, created uh, uh, training courses for our teachers, which are again very exciting products, courses on uh, online skills as well as uh, literacy, as early literacy. These courses are now hosted in the Government of India's Diksha platform. Again, uh, it's, it's available to all teachers who can access these courses. And then that's the product, I think, which, uh, which we are very proud of. Uh, we have also done uh, innovative applications. We have, uh, for example, in Maharashtra, we have tried a chatbot technology on libraries. So basically how how to use a library, what kind of processes, what kind of activities you do through a chatbot medium, we interact with teachers. I mean, those are interesting uh, ideas on technology that we have tried out. We have also tried out technology in the area of assessments and monitoring. Again, that's a very obvious choice. When you are working at scale, uh, you would like to have information coming to you uniformly across a larger section. So, you know, all our field staff now, they have tablets or laptops, so they can feed in information with that case and analyze both learning improvement and learning uh, outcome, um, you know, information as well as information related to classroom processes so this whole use of technology on monitoring and assessment which i think is a very sustained uh, uh, i mean that's one area where technology has helped to be has uh, proved to be very beneficial so 
we have worked on that as well so i think the teacher courses the children material the technology for um, uh, monitoring and assessments all three areas are have been very interesting there are exciting applications that we are working on in each of these three areas uh, in in uttarakhand we are working with the state government on developing a app for measuring uh, uh, learning outcomes reading out uh, outcomes at a primary level so there are all these various applications that we are doing uh, which are all very exciting so we hope to continue some of them uh, some of them of course all the one thing that we are very sure is we are never going going to become a technology organization technology for us will always be something to supplement that we provide to the child directly physically uh, through the physical interaction and so we we don't even for literacy cloud which is as i said which is a cloud based platform for our story books that's not supposed to you know uh, at the cost of a physical story book i mean we we still continue to promote the child to have a physical story book in hand and read through it but we also realize that and there's a limit to how many story books that you can provide to a child especially when you are working at scale and therefore the literacy cloud is kind of uh, supplementing what what you are providing in the classroom so uh, so as an organization we are very clear that we don't see technology as something that's replacing uh, classroom daily interaction in the classroom it's only sub- something that's going to supplement what you do Lomkuri's uh, journey in the last five years have been also of a very uh, accelerated growth. I mean, we we have been, a, as I was saying, mentioning, we have uh, typically worked in a few number of schools in a very intensive way. And in the last five to seven years is when we have started talking about scale, when we have started implementing this I do, we do, you do approach. to scaling up things so already that's on a very fast paced growth trajectory um in in terms of future years um our direct intervention model is going to continue because that's our that's our learning ground that's where we do all our innovations learn uh, and so that is definitely going to continue and expand uh, we're currently across 11 states so we might expand to a few more states so that's one way of growth the second model the we do model that i talked about where we are jointly implementing with government that's supposed to uh, substantially increase in the years to come because that we believe is a very sustainable model of for scaling so uh, wherever applicable wherever possible wherever we have the funds we will try to do joint programming with the government uh, both at the literacy side and and the girls education side and finally i think the the biggest growth will come from the area of system reforms and uh, and system strengthening because now the policy environment is pretty uh, you know supportive there is a nipun program that the government of india has launched for early literacy fln financial literacy and numeracy so that um, that provides a right policy environment for every state to work on uh fln reforms and and i think room to read will play an increasingly active role in supporting these reforms at the state level in supporting governments to plan for foundation literacy numeracy to plan for implementing designing programs around that so that's going to be a big area of our growth in the uh, in the years to come uh, programmatically we are also looking at um, growing a few aspects of our program we still will remain very focused on early literacy and girls education but on the early literacy side we uh, as the national education policy now talks about foundation literacy from preschooling and continuing up to grade 3 so our programs will increasingly uh, start aligning with that view where we'll probably have to start at a preschool cover preschool as well as as the early grades on the girls education side similarly uh, we have done some you know interventions of 
working with boys because again we we realize that boys are a critical component of any gender equality effort and so i think the girls education program would expand to include boys in the days to come maybe not this year but in future years that's going to happen uh, programmatically so both programmatically and implementation wise we are looking for a very exciting next few years next 5 to 7 and 10 years where i think room to read is going to grow exponentially in these years Yes, and children are definitely the core of what you do. As I said, I mean, our work is to make changes happen at the school level. And if you are looking at school level changes, your your primary audience is going to be teachers and children. Right. So I think that will remain core of of our work. In order to make systemic changes, which I said, I mean, the scale mm-hmm. of impact to look at impact at scale to uh, to change systems at a large system uh, uh, we will definitely have to engage with other levels of government and government also so we have to engage with the middle management the block resource centers the cluster resource centers we will have to uh, engage with district education officials state education officials and probably uh, in some cases uh, you know orient them to new ways of doing things some cases support them hand hold them into better planning and implementation so those things will do as and uh, as and when required to be done but i think the core still remains uh, children and teachers yes that's right.